I'm very happy to be here again to speak uh, on the euro. The, the timing is perfect. Um, probably Joe Salerno called Varoufakis in the beginning of the year and told him, well, let the crisis escalate in July so that we have a very time, timeless uh, topic for me this year. Um, we were, we were very close of an exit of Greece from the Eurozone. Um, why? why? Where does all the mess come from? Uh, what is happening in Greece? Where are we going? Uh, if you're interested in this quest these questions, you're, you're right here. Um, in order to understand all the problematic of the, of the Euro, it, to understand it, you have to combine a historical analysis with an economic analysis. You have to s look where the euro comes from and how the monetary system is set up. So we will, we will in this lecture, we will do both. Um, there are two visions for Europe. There's a libertarian or a classical liberal one and a socialist one. The founding fathers of... Uh, the European integration, the EU, Konrad Adenauer, uh, Robert Schumann, Alcide de Gaspari, they were still closer to this uh, classical liberal vision. They had experienced the, the war. You know? They wanted peace for Europe. You know? They were influenced very much by these experience, experiences. By the way, they, 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 all of them were Catholic and they spoke together German. They were all German speakers. Um, um, for this vision, uh, the most fundamental Christian European value is individual liberty. In this vision, there still exists the sovereign states that defend property rights. There are open borders and the free exchange of goods and services. And one early success of this vision was were the Treaty of Rome in 1957, that established free trade of goods, services, and also free movement of people in the European Union. The only problem of the Treaty of Rome was that the French politicians introduced the, uh, the CAP, the Common Agricultural Policy, which is basically well, subsidies for and central planning for agriculture. Well, this vision just wanted to bring back what classical liberalism had achieved in the 19th century and what had been lost during the age of nationalism and socialism in two world wars. Uh, this vision recognizes that we only need liberty for flourishing and peace, and we don't need a European superstate. Then, on the other hand, we have the socialist vision, which is represented by politicians as Jacques Delors or François Mitterrand, and they want a European superstate. They want Europe to be like a fortress, like an empire, protectionist to the outside and interventionist to the inside, um, with a redistribution within Europe, and the, uh, the sovereign states cease to exist, and they all become subjects to Brussels. The, the idea of a European superstate or, uh, is nothing new. Charles the Great, Napoleon, Hitler, they all wanted to establish one European empire, a central government in Europe, by military means. Now the means are slightly less uh, violent. Uh, they are more political means. <clears throat> and one tactic of the socialist side is is typically you know, to use crisis situations to enhance the power of the central government, of um, the European Commission, for example. And we see this again in the crisis situation that we have, the euro crisis. The ECB is assuming more power. The EU Commission is assuming more powers. New institutions are founded, the European stability, stability mechanism, and so on. So these are the two visions. Um, 
of course, there's a struggle between them because they are mutually uh, uh, they, they are contradicting each other. More power for the central states me means less liberty. Um, to get an idea who's on which side, who's more on the libertarian side and who's more on the socialist side. These are, of course, only tendencies, and of course, the governments always also change. But there, there we can see some general tendencies. For example, Great Britain, the Netherlands, Germany, they are more closer to the vision of independent states, the tradition of liberty, while uh, France, uh, Belgium, and the southern nations there are more on the side of um, the socialist vision for Europe. Mm. And the socialists um, in Europe are normally always led by the French political elite. Uh, France is, uh, is key to understand the European Union and the euro, also what happened in Greece, uh, like uh, last week. After the humiliation of 1940, you know, the blitz, uh, Blitzkrieg and the loss of the colonies, the French political elite was, uh, wanted like, uh, a substitute for the lost empire in Europe. And the French political elite wanted, wanted also to prevent that Germany would recuperate its natural weight and power uh, in the heart of Europe and got back its lost territories. So the idea was to absorb to absorb Germany into, into uh, European Union under the leadership of France. No? So that was the idea, and it looked like the socialist side would win. No? Uh, over the years, the EU budget would increase, there would be more regulations, more harmonizations, the EU Commission would get more power. So, so it looked like the socialists were winning, but then one unexpected event happened that Ludwig von Mises had uh, um, predicted 70 years ago, the fall of communism. No? Com the Berlin Wall came down in 1989. And this changed the scenario completely. The balance of power changed completely. Why? Because for one, with the re reunification of Germany, no? the communist eastern part would join West Germany, Germany would get more power and Germany was more on the libertarian side. Also, the countries of the East, of Eastern Europe, Czechoslovakia, Pol uh, Poland, Hungary, they wanted to join. And they were, of course, tired of empires. They would not come in on the socialist side. They would come in on the libertarian side. So the balance of power was about to tip against the socialists. Um, in fact, the French government did not want... Um, or they vetoed, vetoed a, a, fast, a fast extension of the EU eastward, eastwards uh, in the 1990s because they feared that otherwise the EU would just degenerate in their terms into a great uh, free trade zone. No? So the balance of power was to tip against the socialists. What did they do? Well, they did one step forward, um, which was they uh, pressured for the introduction of a common currency, uh, the euro. And the plans were, had always been there, but they knew that now we have to push this on because otherwise well, the whole project would, could go to the libertarian side and more to a free trade zone. Here we have some statements that show uh, the intention behind the introduction of uh, the euro. I mean, we have here an ex-president of France who said that the ECB would finally put an end to the monetary supremacy of Germany. Uh, Jacques Attali said that the Maastricht Treaty that introduced uh, the euro was just a complicated contract whose purpose was to get rid of the mark, the German currency. And uh, Mitterrand said to Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher, without a common currency, we are all, you and we, under German rule. When they raise their interest rates, we have to follow and you do the same, even though uh, you do not particip participate in our currency system. No? We can only join in if there's a European Central Bank where we decide together. So these were the motivations behind the introduction of the euro. We should not never forget this. 
So, why was the German Central Bank so feared by French politicians, for example? Why want, did they want to get rid of the Bundesbank? Why did they want to have the European Central Bank where they could control it? Um, in fact, there was a saying that the most dreaded German institution after World War II was uh, the Bundesbank. Well, in, before the euro, we had the European Stability Mechanism. That was a system of fixed exchange rates. And to maintain fixed exchange rates, um, to, to be in the system, you can, only you, <clears throat> you can only inflate as much as the country that inflates less which was typ typically Germany. Um, so take the Fran French government. If the French government wanted to increase their spending, have a government deficit, and want to print uh, money to finance the deficit, they could not do so if the German Bundesbank would not print at the same rhythm. Uh, because otherwise they would have to devalue. They would have the rule will, that would be very embarrassing, that would show the population, oh, you're doing a worse job than German politicians. Uh, it's like a smoking gun that there has been inflation. So uh, they did not want to do that. That means indirectly stubborn German monetary politicians that did not inflate as much as other countries were restricting government spending in France. The French government could not spin, spend as much, has, it could not have as high a deficit as it wanted, it could not print as much money as it wanted because of this system. So they wanted to get rid of the Bundesbank. Uh, and the euro was, of course, uh, the, the means to achieve it. Um, there's uh, there's uh, this anecdote that I like to tell that about... Um, French and German diplomats coming together at the end of the 1980s because uh, the French were installing short-range nuclear, nuclear weapons at the border uh, to Germany that it would only reach into, into Germany. <laughs> so the German politicians, of course, that is kind of awkward situation. Of course, of, of course the, um, the legitimation was, yeah, if, if the Soviets would invade Western Germany, yeah, then we will attack them there. But of course, that's not really, really a nice, nice night either, even if the Soviets come in, that you're nuked with atomic weapons. So um, the Trump diplomats said, what can we do about this? Can we do something about this? And the French response was, um, let's first uh, talk about the German atomic bomb. And then the Germans are said, well, you know that we are not allowed to have atomic weapons and we don't have any. Uh, what are you talking about? And then the French replied, yeah, the D mark, uh, the Deutsch mark we are talking about. So here, there you see that um, it was like a threat to, to French sovereignty uh, because indirectly uh, through the Bundesbank and the inflationary policy that was not as inflationary as the French wanted, they were restricting policy options. Uh, they were restricting French government spending. They wanted to get rid of it. So, um, the fall of the Berlin Wall was then a unique opportunity to achieve this end. Uh, and now the archives are opened. And uh, this is now, now a fact that François Mitterrand demanded the introduction of a single currency in exchange for his permission for uh, German reunification. Mm -hmm. You have to remember the situation in 1899 that Germany was still occupied by the four allies, militarily, of course, vastly inferior to, to France, no full sovereignty, no peace treaty signed. And then comes Mitterrand and says, well, okay, you can, get, have, you can have your reunification, but to be sure that you don't attack us again, we need more uh, unification in Europe, more centralization in Europe, and uh, integration, we need a single currency. 
He actually threatened by saying, if we don't step forward with European integration, we will have a situation as in 1913. You know what happened in 1914. First World War broke out, two-front war for Germany. It didn't go so well twice in the 20th century. So, of course, if, you, if Mitterrand says this to a German politician, what does it mean? Well, it's like a threat of isolation and there's like a trauma, German trauma, that had to be isolated because it uh, led to try to catastroph catastrophes. So, long, long story uh, short, at the end, uh, it meant the end of the DMARC, which was an important victory for the socialist vision because uh, it means the euro, the euro, as you will see, provokes crisis that can then be used for, for more integration, more centra centralization in Europe. <coughs> what are the reasons why inflation-prone countries wanted the euro, besides of getting rid of the Bundesbank, which we already discussed? Well, one was to get the prestige of this. Uh, of the central bank, which had, had a lot of prestige. If you get this presti prestige also for your currency, your currency will be stronger, uh, your imports will be lower, your population will be more happy. Another reason was the seniorage. You know what seniorage is? Seniorage is the profits from central bank money production. Um, here the seniorage of the ECB. Uh, is distributed in a, in a unique way. All central banks at the end of the year send their profits to the ECB in a common pool and then from this pool the profits are distributed uh, according to the capital share. Uh, the capital share was uh, calculated by two measures, by population and GDP. Okay, central banks don't get the same back as they, as they, as they pay in. And surprise, surprise and surprise, Germany gets back less than it pays in. Uh, and France, it's the other way around. So this way is another reason. Mm. Lower interest rates for government debts. Why? Uh, you know that in the market interest rate, you have very several components. You have the original rate of interest determined by type preference. Then you have a risk premium for, for possible default. And there's an inflation premium for the inflationary expectations. Both of these later premiums were reduced because the risk premium, for example, for Italian debt was reduced when they joined uh, the common currency <clears throat> because it was assumed by markets that if things get really worse the stronger nations will bail out the weaker nations so the risk premium on government debt or on Spanish government debt on Greek government debt Italian government debt was reduced so these countries, these governments had to pay lower interest rates on their debts and this, mar this market expectations that the strong countries would, governments would bail out uh, governments in, uh, in problems, of course, turned out to be right. And inflation expectations went also down because the idea was with the euro that we will, it's also placed in Frankfurt, so it will be like the Bundesbank, so it will be less inflationary as, for example, the lira or the peseta. So that, this meant that all these countries suddenly had to pay much lower interest rates on their debt, which gave them a margin for more government spending. Uh, it's like, like a Christmas present for all these politicians. It was also an excuse for austerity measures because some of these countries were already on the verge of bankruptcy, uh, Italy for example, um, so they had to do reforms and now they could sell these reforms, these austerity measures to the population saying we have to do this because we want to go get into the euro. We have to privatized, telefonica, etc. So it was an excuse to say this. Now, monetary redistribution also, as we will see, that uh, 
with the euro, more new money was introduced in southern countries than in the northern countries. And uh, strong, the stronger currency, of course, um, is also good for you because the imports are, are cheaper. Your mm, population is richer. Here are some graphs to uh, illustrate it. Here you see the interest rate, uh, three months interest rate on government bonds um, in some, uh, here the, some countries. The, the low line, the red line is Germany. And you see <coughs> that the interest rates uh, approach the German level. So the risk premium and the inflationary premium were, were reduced. Once it, when, once it became clear who would join the monetary union, uh, which started in 98. So there you can see that uh, uh, they approach the German um, level. Of course, there's still the difference with Greece because Greece did not uh, join, were not the first uh, members of the Eurozone. So they came only in in 2001 when they had falsified their statistics. So not, not yet at this point. So there's still a difference. And later they also came down, come down to the German level. Uh, uh, here you see the unit labor costs. And this is like an indicator for competitiveness. And you see <coughs> that the southern countries <laughs> used um, uh, the euro for um, increase in wages. And there were huge increase in wages in these countries. They got less competitive. Uh, there were government deficits and so on. <coughs> Higher wages, less competitive. While in Germany, which is the green line, from 95 to 2010, it got more competitive. That means that wages did not rise. So they were basically constant and productivity increased. So competitiveness increased. <laughs> and I show you this because it's often said that Germany was the great benefiter, uh, the great winner of the euro. Um, but actually wages were, 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 were constant and also cons consumption. Here you see consumption from 95 to 2010. And the, the blue line in consumption, if you take consumption as a proxy of uh, living standards, you see uh, no, no, <coughs> not, now not such a great deal it was zero. If you compare to France, consumption increased 40 percent or Spain increased uh, from 2000 only to 2007 more than 20 percent consumption here is um, here's the increase in, in, in M3 and here you see also that most of the new money was introduced in the south in the red line is Spain the, Blue line is uh, Greece. Oh, the money supply was increasing between 10 and 20 percent in these countries. While in Germany, is the thick blue line it was mostly less of the new money was going there. Okay, so these were the reasons why the southern countries wanted. Um, you, you see, the, the consumption increased, the living standard increased, the oil rate. Um, uh, but why uh, would the Germans want the euro? Well, the population were against it, economists were against it, lawyers said it was unconstitutional. As we already said, there was like, like the gun, if you, if, you don't, if you don't do the euro now, you won't get your reunification. German politicians also wanted to get rid of the Bundesbank uh, because they wanted more government spending. but, but they could, they could not win against the Bundesbank because the Bundesbank had a very strong support in the population um, due to uh, the hyperinflation after World War I and then after World War II in the monetary reform again. All savings were basically lost. So the Bundesbank had, with its anti-inflationary stand, had a strong support in the population. And when a politician dared to touch the independence of the Bundesbank, the politician would lose elections. So uh, they wanted to get rid of it. 
and this was a way to achieve it, the euro. Um, and also, uh, this, uh, this is idea also of this class of politicians that with the common currency there would be never war again. It's a question of war and peace for Helmut Kohl, for example, the common currency. And there would be no war again. And it also would be kind of self-protection because uh, you know how, how aggressive uh, Germans are. And if you, if you don't chain yourself with the current currency, you will probably invade uh, other countries again. I mean, <laughs> I'm restricting myself also very hard because my Teutonic genes are pressing me to attack you. But <laughs> I also have great self-discipline. So, so this self-discipline they wanted to enforce through a current currency. No, it's seriously, they argued this, this in the Bundestag, in the parliament. Um, that they, they argued in the parliament that Germany would be, could have been a threat to Europe, to peace twice. Uh, so now we have to do this. Okay, let's come to the uh, economics. Um, the ECB, how, is, how it is set up. Let's compare first with the Fed. Um, the Fed uh, with the Fed, the monetar monetization of uh, government deficits is slightly different. If the government spends more than it receives in taxes, for the difference, it, it prints some paper and write on it, use it uh, US Treasury bonds, then the banking system Buy, may buy these bonds and sell them, them to the Fed. Or well, the Fed uh, recently actually bought them directly, the bonds. So then the banking system gets more reserves and can expand uh, credits, which, with this, which is its main business and very attractive. No? So the government bonds go to the Fed and more money is created. Um, then the government pays interest on its bonds, the Fed has a profit, and what, what does it do with the profit? You guess, what will it do with the profit? Sends it back to the government, <coughs> uh, at least a, a large amount of it, the majority. So it's a very nice way to finance your expenditures by just printing paper, you write on it, government bonds, you never have to pay it because when they come to you, you issue, you issue more of them, you don't even have to pay the interest because the interest flows back to you. Or you, you, you print more government bonds to pay the, pay the interest. How is it in the, in the Eurozone? In the Eurozone, it's, it, uh, traditionally, it's slightly different. When a government spends more than it receives in taxes, it also prints government bonds. Um, the banks buy these bonds and then they pledge them as collateral for new loans from the ECB. So traditionally the ECB, as does the Fed, did not buy these bonds, it just accept them as collateral and gives them new reserves, more loans to the banking system, then the banking system has more reserves and can expand credit. So here the ECB does not become the legal owner of the bonds, as does the Fed, it has just has, has it as, uh, had the bonds as collateral. And as long as the loans are rolled over, renewed, it's, it is the same. Uh, here's the difference, of course, that the interests now are paid to the banking system because the banking system are the, is the legal owner of the bonds and the banking system has to pay interest, you know, of course, to the lo for the loans from the ECB, but there's a differential, so some money uh, is, uh, remains in the banking system. And of course, the ECB makes profit, <laughs> which is remitted then back to the governments. And the profits are the sovereign. Uh, so, the difference, of course, is here that we have not one government in the Eurozone, but several. So, my argument in the book, uh, it's called The Tragedy of the Euro, is it's a tragedy of the commons. What is the tragedy of the commons? It's an extreme case of negative externalities, which always arise when they are inappropriate, when there's an inappropriate defense or definition of property rights. 
where several individuals can exploit one commonly owned resource. Uh, an example are schools of fish in the ocean. And there are several fishers, they all can fish the fish, <laughs> the fishes, and so the incentive is to fish them as fast as possible, because if I don't fish the fish, well, the other fisher will come and, and get it. So even if I have a small fish, I will, won't uh, throw it back into the ocean, because, because the other fisher will get it. If, I would be, if the swarm of the school of fish would be my private property, then I would have totally different incentives. I would only fish so, so much that it can reproduce itself, probably because I own the capital value of the school. But if there are others that they can get them, then the incentive is to fish as fast as possible. The consequence is, of course, an over-exploitation of the commonly owned resource. Here, uh, with, uh, we have the same. What is the commonly owned resource here? Well, it's the purchasing power of, of the euro. When a government uh, spends more than it receives in taxes, it can print their government bonds, the banking system buys them, gives them to the ECB, the ECB produces more money, gives reserves to the banks, they can expand credit. As a consequence, there's a tendency for prices to increase for the purchasing power of money to fall. <clears throat> so the negative externalities is uh, the loss in purchasing power. The incentives then for the government, for the politician, let's take here the Greek politician, um, is, okay, I can buy votes uh, simply, meant, simply by spending more, by just printing my Greek government bonds that then are bought and monetized, and then prices rise, but prices rise not only in Greece. They rise all in the whole Eurozone, they rise. They rise in France, they rise in Italy, they rise in Germany. So part of the costs of my deficits, part of the costs of uh, my gifts, presents to the voters, part of these costs I can externalize on funds, on Italians, French, Germans, and the cool thing is they don't vote in Greek elections. <laughs> so I <clears throat> can give uh, a gift to my voters and the costs are part partially uh, externalized on others. No, it's a case of counting your own effects. The first receivers of the new money profit, in this case the Greek government and the last receivers and some uh, maybe other European uh, Eurozone country, they lose because <coughs> prices rise. Uh, before the, the income is rising. And because <laughs> not only the Greek politician, but all politicians have this incentive, it's a tragedy of the commons. Uh, the commonly owned resource is the purchasing power of the euro. It can be exploited by running a deficit that is financed through the banking system and the ECB. And the incentive is to fish as fast as possible also. Uh, imagine the following, the following example. Um, um, let's say Germany has a deficit of 3% of GDP and the rest of the Eurozone has a deficit of 10% of GDP. All these deficits, are, all these bonds are, mo are monetized through the way that I explained. So prices rise uh, on average 8% in the Eurozone. That means that the German government, even though it has a government deficit, its real government spending may actually fall because prices rise faster than their deficit. So in this redistribution, you can only win if you, if you have a higher deficit than the others. So you have to fish faster than the others. You have to have a, of course, you see immediately that this is highly destructive. This leads uh, um, to a, yeah, to a high, hyperinflation. It's comparable to a printing press that we would have here, a printing press to print dollars, and we would, could all use it. Of course, I use it. Prices go up, you use it, prices go up. They say, oh, prices have gone up, I have to print more. <laughs> and then you print also, you print faster. You, we all print every faster and it all ends very quickly in hyperinflation. So then the question is obviously, why does the euro still exist? Why has it not died, died in hyperinflation? Well, I explained it to you um, um, already. Of course, governments cannot print directly euros. They can only print this paper and write on it 
Greek government bond or German government bond. They depend on that the banks buy it, buy these bonds, and that the ECB accept these bonds as collateral. And this is not guaranteed. So there's some risk in it. For example, the ECB could say, well, you have accumulated so, so many debts, mm, I, we won't accept your bonds anymore as collateral. So you have to be somewhat careful in this. Mm. <coughs> at, at the end, of course, even though the uh, rating of Greek government bonds, for example, were rated junk bonds, the ECB still accepted these bonds as collateral. Mm. It shows that the, this limit, this limit to the tragedy of the commons, but, which, which is the risk that the ECB will not monetize your, your, your government bonds, is reduced because the, the EU is a political project and the ECB at the end accepts your collateral no matter what. Your bonds, government bonds, no matter, no matter what, even if it's rated junk. Another limit for the tragedy of the commons is uh, the Stability and Growth Pact. The Stability and Growth Pact established that there should be a limit on government deficit of 3% of GDP. Like, like, this is like the fishers saying, okay, let's fish only X tons of fish per year. Let's exploit this commonly owned resource, the purchasing power of the euro, only 3% of GDP. Well, the problem here was that, that uh, no one ever regarded this as uh, a rule that had to be uh, followed. Um, in 2010, all countries except Luxembourg had a GDP of more than 3%. No? <laughs> the last... Uh, yeah. Greece probably never had a deficit lower than 3% or beside the year they, they got entry into, into the Eurozone. Why did it not work? Because it was basically a voluntary agreement be between fishers. No one is enforcing it. So the run for deficit continues. Uh, the stability and growth pact was a failure. Okay. I will skip this because we are running out of time, that the euro con generates conflicts. You know, we know that free trade brings you in contact with each other. Harmonious cooperation generates peace. While the euro generates conflicts because it, it ends this harmonious uh, cooperation. cooperation. You, you, as a Greek government, you just run deficits to buy... Uh, that you accumulate de debts that will never be paid to buy uh, German goods, no? And then when Germans, uh, German government says, well, you should not have higher debts, you should, should stop that, then uh, the conflict arises. I wanted to uh, uh, explain you a little bit uh, the situation of Greece because it is so recent and talk about the Greeks, uh, Greece bailout, uh, bailouts. As you are seeing, the Greece government has been bailed out from the very beginning through the tragedy of the euro. <clears throat> and that uh, indirectly, mm, the Greek uh, debt was guaranteed by stronger nations. And through the exploitation of the purchasing power of the euro, they could... Uh, have higher, much higher real government spending than they would have had otherwise. Well, the bailout was made explicit then in May, May 2010 with uh, 110 billion euros. Uh, um, then in May 2010, the ECB started or also buying directly Greek government bonds, which is actually prohibited in the Maastricht Treaty. Then in 2012, there was another bailout uh, of 130 billion. There was also debt restructuring where private bondholders lost 75%, which amounts to 10,000 euros for, for every Greek. Okay, so then on the 25th of January, Syriza, the party is elected in, in, uh, in Greece. And of course, it was, it was clear, uh, they said it before, we won't continue with austerity measures. We will hire new public employees, we will have a higher deficit and so on. So this was 
it is a big thing, you know, that on the 25th of January, Syriza is elected because it can change all of, of, of the euro. It, it can mean that Germany has to pay more uh, to keep it afloat. Uh, there will be, could be another, um, another bailout. bailout. It could be very bad for re, uh, German, for the German population. Spiegel, which is the most common German weekly magazine, uh, had a cover. What, what do you think they had a cover the day before? Any idea? You think it's, it's on Greece? Seventy years anniversary of Auschwitz liberation. So it was more important that 70, 70th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz like it says the letzten Zeugen, the last uh, testimonials. Um, of course, Germans ha have to be guilty, feel guilty still today. Huh? To bear, and it's their duty to mankind to at least to maintain the euro, to bail out grief. No? <laughs> so, I con coincidence or not, well, the day before they, they brought this in Spiegel. And, <laughs> Uh, yeah, there's a, a guilt complex no, in, in Germany, which explains why the euro still exists, and because otherwise it would not. I have also put you the, this cover, which was then in March. It shows, I mean, you could, you could expect such a cover maybe in Greece, no? But to have it in Germany, it's, uh, it's amazing no, to have Angela Merkel there with uh, Wehrmacht soldiers at the Acropolis. Good. Okay, you, you, you see how public opinion in Germany uh, works. Um, to continue with the, with the story, uh, Syriza then said, okay, we won't, we, we want of course more bailout money, but we won't do uh, what you tell us because we are democracy and we want to hire more public employees and so on. So what did the ECB do? It stopped. It stopped to accept Greek debt as collateral. It's basically, it cut. It cut the line. But at the same time, it extended ELA. What is ELA? It's Emergency Liquidity Assistance, um, which says that the National Central Bank can accept basically whatever they want as collateral at their own risk. That is, if there are losses, the national Natural, natural Central Bank of Greece will suffer the losses uh, and, and not the other central banks. So what does it mean? Uh, in the case of a bank run, for example, if a Greek citizen gets cash out of his bank, the Greek bank does not have reserves, the Greek bank demands a loan from the Central Bank of Greece, which is in this case ELA, and it can put anything as collateral, Greek government or bonds or bank debt, whatever. So this is an example of the bank run, how it uh, works. It needs ELA. Uh, capital flight, how does it work in this scheme? For example, when a Greek citizen says, I transfer my money to a German bank, to Deutsche Bank. So it gets, it reduces his amount in the Greek bank and transfer, transfers it to Germany. What does it mean for the Greek bank? Of course, it needs also more reserves. It has to go to the Central Bank of Greece and demand another loan. And then the Deutsche Bank gets a claim on, on the Bundesbank, uh, the Bundesbank a credit on the ECB and the debit for the Central Bank of Greece. These are the target two. Yeah? Uh, uh, a debit and credit claims. So you see that to continue the transfer of Greek money to Germany, you need more ELA. And also to get cash out of, out of the bank, you need more ELA. So what happened then? On June 27th, uh, Tsipras announced to hold a referendum on the bailout conditions. Next day, ECB says, no more ELA. We won't increase ELA. Uh, so that means <laughs> game over for Greek banks. Uh, if we go back uh, here, if, if Greeks get more cash out of their fractional reserve banks, the cash is not there, they, they need more. Hmm? They, and then the Greek banks need more ELA, but the ECB said, no, no more. So what did, did the Greek government do? It, it closed the banks, no other options. 
<laughs> and this is what how fraction reserve banking works. And of course, also no more capital flights. Greeks could, they had to in introduce capital controls um, because if a Greek transfers his money to, to a German bank or a Swiss bank or so, the, the bank needs also more loans from the Greek um, central bank and this was prohibited when ELA was frozen. So what they had to do is to introduce bank holidays and capital controls. Okay, then there was the no vote. 2,915 is not, <clears throat> and, and then at the end, the French position again prevailed. Uh, I mean, you can see it on all the history of the euro that the French position always prevails, that you, you get rid of the DMARC, you get uh, French president of the ECB and so on, you do all the bailouts, and here again, there will be a third bailout, Greek, uh, Greece will receive 86 billion additional euros, which is not so bad, because it's 50% of GDP. So, not, <coughs> not so bad. <laughs> and of course, there's no intention to ever pay back the money. So the conclusion, the fu future of Europe and the euro depends on who will finally pay the debts. They, that will never be paid back in real terms. There are several options. And of course, also how the tragedy of the commons will be addressed, because if this problem of the tragedy of the euro still co exists, even if we reduce the debt, the problem will be there again. There are three possibilities, which, uh, I mean, I already in 2010 uh, put these possibilities and they are, still, uh, they are still the logical possibilities. One is the reform of the Stability and Growth Pact, that is, 3% restriction of deficits, or make it 2% or zero. With penalties if governments do not comply. It, it implies harsh austerity measures and structural reforms. This is the option that my, my intellectual father, Huerta de Soto, uh, hopes for and thinks will happen. Mm. The problem is, of course, that uh, the population may be too socialist or have maybe have gotten too accustomed to the welfare state to accept this. And you see this in, the, in Greece, no? that the population voted for a party that said no to these austerity measures. The next option is the Eurozone split. Greece leaves, and we were very close to that. We were, we were, we were very close to that. Or, and this is far more ahead, of course, because the German population has the guild complex and so on. So, but if, if things get really ugly for a long time, it could be that Germany actually leaves. And the last option is uh, a transfer union, that continually there will be transfer, transfers uh, from, from the north to the south. There will be more centralization. There will be more inflation, the European super state. And with this Greece uh, example, we had, we had all of them. No? They talked about austerity measures, they promised, it was close to split up, and we will have more transfers, more uh, centralization. Where will it go? Well, I hope the history of the euro and the, of the, euro and the theory that I presented here will give you a hint. Uh, a hint. Thank you very much. <laughs>